Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hi, everyone. I want to just mention, before we get started, a couple of things. One is that I'm always, as you know, so gratified by how many people listen to us all over the world. And when I see these lists of people who listen to the show in such varied places as Iceland and New Zealand and Austria, it helps me know that this show is accomplishing something that I had had in mind from the beginning, which was to try to provide, if I could, something for everyone. Something that would speak to people from different backgrounds, from different nationalities, where they would find something that was interesting to them or something that was helpful to them. And so I love the varied audience. And if you are in Iceland or in New Zealand or Austria or any of the other places that listen, again, as always, be in contact and let us know about your interest in the show. I also wanted to mention before I introduce the guest for today, and besides just introducing her, I want to mention too that not only is she doing an episode today, but she's also doing a bonus episode for the Patreon supporters where she delves deep into a lot more of the feelings that went into creating her masterpieces, her music. And so you can go to patreon.com slash indoctrination to become a supporter of the show and you will hear her bonus episode along with so many other bonus episodes and also get some good goodies for you to thank you. The thing that I have to mention, though, is what is happening now in the world, what is happening, of course, in other places in the world, too, that I don't have time to mention on this particular show. But I want to mention what's happening in the Middle East. Whenever there is bloodshed, whenever there is death and destruction, whenever there are people of all ages, all ethnicities who are affected, I think about the long-range implications of this. I think about the tragedy, but I think about the trauma. And I think about, of course, the children. The children who are always caught in the crosshairs between the adults who are making these decisions. And so my heart goes out to everyone there who is suffering, who is feeling just worn down by what's happening around them too, even if they're not directly affected. But in a small place like Israel, everyone to a certain degree knows at least somebody else, whether they be within their Israeli family or within their Palestinian family or group of friends. But they can put a face to someone who has been kidnapped, someone who has been killed, somebody who is suffering right now, someone who was injured, who needs care. And so I think about everybody there, and I'm sure many people listening are thinking about that region of the world today as well. shifting gears. Today, I am very happy to be able to have Jolie Holland back on the show. She is a world-renowned Los Angeles-based artist who has forged a timeless and captivating musical legacy, mining the depths of her at times harrowing life experiences. Her fearless creative choices are rooted in honesty and in presence. She is a co-founder of the musical trio the Be Good Tanyas, and has been featured on Bob Dylan's Theme Time Radio Hour. Jolie was raised as a fourth-generation Jehovah's Witness, and her music inherently carries emotional themes inextricable from her cult experience. These concepts of cult dynamics are subtly woven throughout her newly released album Haunted Mountain, including on the mesmerizing title track, a duet with Buck Meek, the guitarist for the band Big Thief. 
Haunted Mountain is available now on all streaming platforms and on CD and vinyl at julieholandmusic.com. Here's Jolie now. So today, I have someone for you to hear who you've gotten a chance to hear before, but you also, uh, if you become a patron, get to hear a bonus episode with her talking about her music, her latest album, and some of the very, very powerful ideas that were woven into the wording, and I'm sure the music too, just based on um, her background. I would love it, Jolie, if you took a moment to introduce yourself and talk about why you're on this particular show. Hi, my name is Jolie Holland, and I am a professional musician for the last 20-ish years. And I was born a fourth generation Jehovah's Witness, and I never got baptized. I was always a very rebellious person in the family, and I was really scapegoated for that. Wow. Okay, so let's talk about that for a moment before we move on. How is being rebellious defined in the group? What does that mean here? Oh, it's amazingly easy to be considered rebellious. Like, I mean, the code for like looking right and, you know, fitting in, it was just one thing. It was like a real cookie cutter kind of presentation. And like, if you differed from that by an incredibly small percent, you were targeted as, you know, being trouble. There's so much control that was tolerated toward female people or non-male people. Right. Yeah, there are usually so many more rules and there's so much more structure around your life and the expectations and your reputation becoming sullied for really no reason. So being scapegoated, though, too, that's interesting. So tell me about that role that was put on you. Yeah, I mean, I just like, I, I really couldn't, imagine someone identifying with me like I I really just like thought of myself as like an alien and I kind of feel like that was one of the basic pre-musical movements towards being a songwriter because like I just thought like my feelings are completely not understandable to anyone around me so Feelings are something that you have to turn into repeatable elements. I think that's why I started writing songs when I was very, very young. Incredible. Right. So here you have this idea of being scapegoated when you're little. And I've talked to a number of people who say that they were scapegoated, say that they were the black sheep. There is something about having that part of your familial connectedness taken away so that when you're disenfranchised, when you have some sort of distance also, sometimes you see things a lot more clearly. And the Black sheep of the family, I've noticed, sometimes has more insight and understands the family or is willing to look at it because they're willing to see what other people aren't willing to see. What do you think it's for you? The scapegoat is like, they're not getting bought off in the same way that everybody else is like they're they're not getting the the fruits of kissing ass that everybody else is getting and you do have this journalistic freedom to talk shit <laughs> right okay and so then i think also you know when you think about now that you're not going to be doing all the things that you're supposed to be doing 24-7, it does leave you with some free time and you need to try to figure out a way to fill it. Some people don't fill it well because 
in that environment, you can really develop a sense of yourself as really not being okay and not deserving good things. And some people are lucky enough or determined enough to find something different for themselves, to find a way to feel different. And music or the arts in general, I think about people who have become artists in other ways, but music specifically is is a way that a lot of times people will talk about their soul being tended to, their bodies being tended to, their minds, and it really becomes its own form of therapy. So I'm wondering if you can let people know about how that all got started for you, how your whole interest in music and exploring it got started. I mean, like, I would just get grounded and, like, I would, you know, just go to my room and work on music, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, Or I would just be out of the house, like, running around outside and, like, I would be writing songs in my head or just, like, singing or something. When I started to try to play in bands, that was incredibly hard you know like just having having like a really like a lack of socialization and like no meaningful education on like how to gauge whether a situation is messed up or not um it was it was really difficult to uh I mean and it still is really difficult to find the right people to play music with I encounter over and over again I'll start working with somebody and um and then like I'll find out that they uh, sexually assaulted people in the community, you know, it's like, it's just really, it's really rampant. And that's like a, just a a constant problem in musical community. I'm happy to be working with a booker that is expressly feminist. Uh, that's, that's awesome. I went to go see a, a big thief show recently and they were, they were so sweet. They thanked all of their crew. Every single name was, a woman, a woman's name. Yeah. Oh, that's really quite beautiful. My goodness. Okay. And so then once you started exploring your musical side, how did it change you emotionally? What did you notice? I really can't remember a time before music, but I remember like the worldview that I was raised with was so bleak. I didn't expect to live past 30, even though like I didn't believe like them the violence of like losing my family really spoke to me on such a basic level of like you know if you want to be yourself you will lose everyone (laughs) that that you've ever loved like it was just that's the the basic thing about excommunication um it's so intense right and you know what you hope is that one day religious organizations will be able to more across the board, because I know some do do this, make you feel like you can be you within the construct of the environment if you choose to stay. And that if you go into playing music that's, let's say, secular, not religious, or if you decide to live a life that's different and make certain decisions, or that if you check in with yourself and realize how you're wired, and that it's different from the way they say that you should be, and then, you know, you're done with. You miss out on being able to have people be happy for what you can do and proud of what you can create. And, you know, it's hard. A lot of people will talk to me about seeing movies and other things where there's a scene of children being in a play, and their parents have come to see them, and they're clapping, and they're thinking that, That never happened. First of all, I never was in those kinds of environments, but my family would not have been there. And in fact, I would have been scared of them showing up. And I wonder what it was like for you when you started playing. Were you, what were you worried about? And what was that experience like for you vis a vis your family? I mean, it was really an experience of just having nowhere to go. I wasn't given any support in excelling in anything. I was uh, in the top 3% of students in Texas. Like I, you know, I went to accept an award with my family when I was like, we, we, we drove to San Antonio. I remember I was probably 13 or something. They were superficially proud of me, but like there was no support. 
any kind of support was withheld of like some kind of nebulous, like if you weren't such a terrible kid, we would get you violin lessons or something. I don't know what I was doing that was like so bad. I think it was just so liberatory to me to tell the truth. Nobody else was like in it as much as I was. And uh, yeah, my mom really bummed me out a lot because she was like, I saw her as such like a wonderful person and she stayed in this like incredibly sad relationship and I would, Mm -hmm. and I tried to encourage her to, to get out and, and find herself and do cool stuff in her life. And it was neat. Like when I left home, she did those things. She could finally do those things, but she still hates me. Her attitude is like, she didn't say this to my face because we don't talk, but I saw it like on her social media. She's like, I'm an excellent mother to my other children. Like she just like, you know, it's like this incredibly fragile thing of like, I don't know why you didn't like my, the way I raised you kind of bullshit, you know, which was terrifying. The way she raised me was like, I'm glad I survived it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Just so people know what you mean by terrifying. (sighs) Oh my God. My mom is so scary. Dead sober, purely cold blooded, she would just talk about killing me all the time. And she like she would talk about it in so many different environments. She would talk about it in like a religious way. She would talk about it in a secular way because she left the witnesses. Like I, you know, I wasn't excommunicated. I think of a lot of my family as being like dry drunk Jehovah's Witnesses where they were so, they were, they were expressing the culture of, of the witnesses which, you know, even before the witnesses, there's like, you could think of that kind of like hardcore Protestant culture of like, Mm -hmm. that's just no fun. And it's just real authoritative and real my way, the highway kind of parenting. It was really powerful for me to see the Leah Remini special about the witnesses. Cause like, you know, I left, I got the fuck out of there. I didn't, I wasn't interested in the witnesses. Like I just thought they were the most boring thing in the world. And it's been really healing to learn more about the witnesses and like understand how incredibly draconian their parenting styles are. Like that Leah Rimini show broke my heart. And there were all these multiple suicides of the kids. And, and like, that was my deal. Like I was calling the suicide hotline when I was like 10 or something. Like I was really, I just, you know, because my mom talked about killing me all the time and I, I believed I was a monster. And that's why she was going to kill you. Is that the reason, at least according to her? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not inside her head, but like, I feel like you know, she had an insanely brutal childhood as well. Like my grandmother, in the right circumstances, my grandmother would have gone to jail for decades. You know, like what what my grandmother did to my mother was just unspeakable, just horrifying. And when I found out about it, that was, I found out the truth about how my mother and my my mother and my father were both raised. And it was both of their mothers were absolute monsters, like the worst people And to me, they were just like my cute grandmas, you know, they, you know, were maybe like a little emotionally manipulative, but like, I feel like most grandmas are a little emotionally manipulative, you know, like it can be seen in a, in a, like a cute way, but like these, they were horrible to their children. And that's when I started getting like real hope for my life where I, because I thought, okay, these two people that raised me to feel so bad about myself for why, why, you know, because like I looked like them or something. I don't even fucking know. Those two people were both absolutely tortured to the point where, yeah, maybe it's like, maybe it's just terrifying to see a person that looks like yourself at that age and like, and just re-traumatizing. Right. So, you know, it's hard to, because when you find out about how your parents were raised and if it is in this horrendous way, you can give them a little more latitude, you know, to kind of understand uh, where some of these behaviors towards you came from at the same time. Once you have children, you have a responsibility to keep those children safe and to be a good parent. So you can't get a total pass once you've decided to do this to somebody else who is just as vulnerable as you were when you were young. Yeah. And I mean, to their credit, they didn't 
they didn't do these horrible things that their parents did to me, but they still really sucked, you know? <laughs> uh-huh. Okay, right. Yeah, and one of the things that also happens when you're scapegoated, when you're the black sheep, when you're ostracized, is that you don't have somebody to talk to. I mean, you don't really even have someone to talk to within Jehovah's Witnesses uh, or within any kind of group like it anyway. No, no, it's this very isolating, uh, authoritative environment where you're you're supposed to go tell the elders and the elders are like these unlicensed, you know, they're just dudes. They're They're just dudes, you know? Right, yeah. Yeah, no, I think about all the people who've come to me um, sharing the advice they got from the people they went to go talk to within their cultic group and how off it was from start to finish. But they had to listen to it, which was, you know, it's amazing. That's pretty rampant. But I think about you being able to then have music as a means of communication, of sharing, of connecting. And how important that probably was for you to to pierce the isolation, to break through the fourth wall of communication. I was writing a lot of these songs in my head that went on to really connect me with other people. But like, I didn't know that at the time. On one hand, it was a couple bucks into my violin case. Then Lucinda Williams, like, listen to my music and, and ask me to sing backup on one of her records, you know, like, that's amazing. Like that I got to, you know, that my music like got to connect with somebody that I love so much. And then, and like, you know, and connected me with these beautiful musicians and big thief and like, that's all incredible. But at the time it was very like, you know, it was all imaginary. And, you know, I think about like, there's a song, um, off my record, Catalpa, it's called All the Morning Birds. And it's like, I wrote it in my head as a homeless person. Like on my record, Haunted Mountain, there's a lot of songs that like have to do with pedestrianism because like I was, I was on the street. I like, that was my mode of transportation. And in All the Morning Birds, that's a similar, it's a song coming from a similar place. And it's talking about like walking across the city at night because I had to get back to where I was staying. And that was the only way I could go. And like just thinking about these people, like and and like feeling my connection to these other people, and like all these people love that song now, you know. And it's it's so neat to think of that as like being this kind of seed that's that flew on the wind and like lives in other people's heads now. My friend Guy Garvey, uh, who has that band, the amazing band Elbow in England, like he said, when he's not thinking, that song is running in his head. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Wow. That's very powerful. Very powerful. And so your experience, even though you may have felt kind of alone with it, was highly relatable. I turned it into something relatable. I think about like Daniel Johnston is such a master at this because he is somebody with severe mental illness. And, you know, he's somebody that like most of us could not identify with. And he sings these songs in such an open-hearted way. And he's like, I know you can feel me. I know you can know where I'm coming from. And it's like that, that power of that like magic act is like, yeah, you, you do. You're like, I totally identify. It's like the opposite of othering. It's this incredible magic act. Right. So, you know, when you think about creating music and with the album that just came out, and then you think about where you came from with with this need for conformity and everyone saying the same things, thinking the same things, what a huge departure it is to get involved in any art form, actually, because you need your your creativity that clearly did not get squelched and probably found um, more of a home in you because out of need. I think about the people I worked with or I work with who were kids in certain groups where they would be punished for imagining and they'd be punished for dreaming. I mean, really. And so just having their own thoughts and and having that creativity that is the spark um, being demonized or being um, treated in a punitive way is incredibly damaging. And that's not to say that they got rid of it. They just learned to not share it uh, because we all have it to varying degrees. And you were able, thank goodness, to use it, I think, as a lifeline in a lot of ways. 
Yeah, I was imagining a way out. Incredible. So I want to make sure to get to two points before we finish up today. And I know there's a lot to talk about, but there is something that you've talked about in the past about self-hatred and that it is something that is seen of value and that's something that is pushed on you. And so let's figure out about that and what you do with that, especially if you're going out and performing. You know, I know there are people I know who are who are artists, who are painters, and it's terrifying for them to have a show of their work. But especially after they were raised either in a cult or in a family system where they were often shamed or made to have self-hatred. And so I'm just wondering about that piece for you and what you what you did with that along the way or what you need to do with it along the way to manage it. I mean, we all live under patriarchy and I just see so much hatred directed at female performers, even from people who are like self-professed feminists. Like somebody just shared a picture of like, it was from the 90s, this like magazine picture, uh, like in a music magazine of like um, Bjork and Tori Amos and PJ Harvey. And it was like, the heading was like, lips, tits, and and hits, or something like that. It was just like some hips and hits, or some bullshit. And uh, like, just so blatant, like this was in the 90s, right? And yet, like, you know, I was talking to my, uh, this guy who managed me, like, uh, over 10 years ago, he saw Lucinda Williams play at, a, at an event. And, and I was like, was she amazing? And he said, well, you know, she's real skinny. Like this, this like like giant and an American song, like this like incredible, incredible musician and and songwriter and singer, and then like this friend of mine, great musician, so called feminist. We were watching Big Thief, and what he had to say was like he was talking about like Adrian's jeans. That's what he wanted to talk about. I just expect to be objectified. You know, I try not to respond to it. Like I try and it's and that is very hard. Like I see a lot of people responding to prejudice in this kind of in this way that like really completely takes over their performance. Like my friend Gerard Smith who's not with us anymore, like he was in that band TV on the radio when he played music on the, in the subway, he made exactly the same amount of money per day as he made being in a gigantic rock band on tour, the exact same amount of money. It's a weird, weird industry, you know, because it's just so expensive to be on a tour bus. It's so expensive to, to live that life. So, but he, the way that he performed in the subway, I feel like on some level he was trying to subvert racist assumptions about him as a black man that he was like playing classical music on the guitar and that's all he did he just played classical music on the guitar as a as a street musician okay so like you know he was doing that and then like in tv on the radio my friend kit malone who's in that band who was also raised jehovah's witness he talked about you know they're an art rock band they're not a funk band in any way whatsoever but like mostly black guys in the band and he would talk about like this fan coming up to them after the show and being like you guys really brought the funk all these like shades of prejudices that are just laid uh, across performers of marginalized communities it's like super interesting it is super interesting disturbing i i think also about um how there are some groups that will tell you that if you get involved, they're going to help you um, with your creative side and you'll be able to really explore yourself. And it often uh, doesn't happen. Or if you explore that creative side, they use your talent for the benefit of the group. And there was a recent um, documentary that came out called Brothers Broken about this group that was big a few decades ago called People. And they had a big hit. And then the two brothers who were running the group got involved in Scientology. And that was the end of the group. 
Um, but it, they were told, you know, you'll be able to be creative, like, you know, like never before, but no, I mean, the person I've talked to is the one who said he then had to channel his music to then do the music for Scientology videos and PR. And he feels tremendously guilty, really believing that his, you know, his music being sort of this music of grandeur while well, L. Ron Hubbard and then David Miscavige were speaking, was used to recruit. So he's trying to pay penance for that, even though it's not his fault. When we also talk about music and when you've talked about what it's done in terms of connecting you, I mean, after you've been ostracized, it's a necessity to have a community. It's a necessity to have any kind of connection. And I'm wondering about how you've been able to do that to create community and in what ways, because people listening to the podcast, some of whom have been able to create community, some have also let me know that they're still feeling really quite isolated and afraid of connecting and are looking for ways to connect. And sometimes in the the nonverbal ways, like through music or art or whatever else, they can do it. But what has been the challenge for you? And also, in what ways do you feel like you've been able to kind of take in information about community and what is safe community that you can share with others? It's so hard. Like I said, I've I've experienced this so many times where I get close to somebody and then I and then I find out that they're not a good person. And I see people that are just super isolated because of of because of what we're talking about. Or they go through it over and over again, this kind of cycle of like trusting too much because they've been raised that like with very bad models of like how to have a good relationship with people. But I think I think it's important to, you know, as scary as scenes are, because like scenes can often harbor nasty people, just like cults are like a, are a breeding ground for all kinds of abusive characters. Scenes can be this place where manipulative people can hide because they're like, oh, so-and-so is my friend. But just to look for really wholesome groups of people. They're going to be friends with other wholesome people. But be careful. Don't fully trust it. There's a power in scenes because, like, that, that's already a pre-created collection of people that could be trustworthy. But just be careful and trust your nose. Right. So one of the things that uh, people talk to me about and I share in terms of trust or being trustworthy is this idea that I may or may not know whom to trust But if I can get to a place where I'm closer to knowing that I can trust myself, then I don't need to be afraid of taking those risks and making those connections because I feel like I'm in more of a position now where I can turn and run or I can say no. I can call the police if I need to. I can speak up. I can discern. I can check in with myself. And get uh, just a feeling, even if it's wrong, but still I'm listening and I'm going to take a moment to take some time away and think, what does this mean? And does it mean anything? And let me assess before just going along. And just that idea of self-reliance being something that helps you feel that you can trust your world a little bit more. I'm wondering about developing that because just developing a voice is not at all of value also in a cultic system, but especially for women. Yeah. No, they hate it. That's super complicated when you, when you're coming out of a, out of a high control group, because yeah. How do you gauge when you've been trained to, to not trust yourself? It's surprising. You can think Oh, I would never believe this nonsense. I know better. I, you know, but, but it gets in there because we're social animals and it's just tricky. I just think like, try to test yourself in lower stakes situations if possible and, and uh, give yourself grace when you fall, like, because we will, because there's, there's a lot of um, untrustworthy people and a lot of people just say things and they really don't mean them. And some people me included. I can't imagine that. I can't imagine saying I'm going to do something and not doing it. Right. I mean, a a value to you, I'm sure, is being a straight shooter because you want 
to say what you mean, but you want people to trust what you say. And if you were around people also who just said things and hard to know if they meant them, and it happens a lot in a lot of businesses and in industries where people are going to be the yes men or yes women or the, you know, the ones who are going to say things in a certain way to get you to do something or to get you to agree to something or to do something for free. That's going to happen quite a lot. But being able to detect it is what makes all the difference. And sometimes there's just a lot of learning that takes place through exposure to it. And stay open to hearing criticism of people that you are around. Like I was working with this guy in New York who then I heard that he had assaulted a couple of friends of mine and he's an incredible liar. Like he just lies all the time. And at first I like, I just thought of it as harmless. I don't know why, because I think the, the stuff he lied about was harmless. And I was just like, oh, this is like a game he's playing, but like, uh, I don't care. I just like him. Like he's a, he had connected me with some people that were important to me. And like, he was in a certain circle that was, uh, I was really interested in the, the kind of music and, and the people in this scene and But I would hear people saying like, oh, that guy. And I really blocked it out at first. I was like, I don't know why they're saying that. That's part of like the trouble of being raised in a high control group is that like, you're so used to black and white thinking. It was such a basic thing for me to just be like, I'm going to believe the guy that's nice to me instead of like seeing the exasperation of other people around him that had known him longer and, you know... He he loaned me $4,000 out of the blue because I was getting a, a new apartment with a friend and she she was like didn't she hadn't told us all that we needed to get the uh the deposit. I didn't have it and I was like $4,000 like I just have to come up with that like out of the blue and I was like working with this guy and I was like, "Oh god, this sucks." And he was like, "Oh, well, you don't want to have to ask, you know, your cousin for a loan. That would suck." So he was like, I'll just get it for you right now. And he just handed me $4,000. He's went to the bank and handed me $4,000. And I was telling our mutual collaborator about this. And she rolled her eyes and she was like, yeah, he's everybody's little angel, isn't he? Wow. And I was like, oh, uh-huh. you know, like I, it was so hard for me to like see that behavior in a negative light, but he was trying to love bomb me. He was trying to like get me on his side. Right. So it was advantageous for him, right? It wasn't just free and clear without strings attached. Now he was like padding his stable of like people who are going to like look good for him to know. Right. Or we're going to owe him. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. And it was so great to have this woman just like rolling her eyes and just being like, what a great guy. (laughs) That's so good. We all need a woman like that. I mean, imagine it just as we're finishing up, if you had had that growing up, if you had had like the neighbor to where you were living who could pop in and go, "Uh uh-huh. Yeah. Right. I know it would have been so beautiful. Yeah. This like window of sarcasm. Yeah. Oh, that would have been fantastic. All right. It is so good to talk to you. And where can people find your album and tell more about what it's called? And where can people find you? My new record, Haunted Mountain, just came out October 6th. And if you can't find it in stores, you can hit me up at juliehonmusic.com and streaming is in all the places. Fantastic. So good to talk to you always. And uh, I wish you well and happy to talk to you again anytime. One more thing before you go. Jolie and I had a great conversation and I'm so glad you got to hear it. And she is also 
doing a bonus episode for the Patreon supporters. So become a Patreon supporter and you'll be able to hear Jolie continue to talk about some of the issues and topics that we had just started talking about here. When Jolie was talking about how she had an upbringing where she learned that self-hatred is good, there was something very powerful about hearing that. It's not unlike what a lot of other people deal with. It's not unlike many of my clients who will say that they were barred from enjoying themselves. They were barred from being happy. They were barred from being proud of themselves. They were barred from laughing, from getting too carried away, that somehow that was the devil or somehow that was not them being spiritual or it was pride. You know, it's given all these other terms where kids don't get to enjoy a moment. And that can continue on into adulthood. So many people I talk to say they catch themselves when they're laughing, when they're enjoying themselves, when they're feeling good, when they're feeling proud. Suddenly this fear wells up in them because they've been told that means they're doing something wrong, religiously speaking, and they quickly stop themselves. And you can see it like they're facial expression suddenly changes and they become serious again. There is so much joy that people raised in these environments are robbed from having. And they have trained themselves so often to get back into misery because that's where you're somehow safest and that's where somehow you're showing yourself to be the best person. There are a lot of people not raised in those environments who wouldn't understand this. Like, why? Why would that be a value to have self-hatred, to be miserable? Well, somehow that is akin to you needing to try harder, to be perfect, to make sure that God is happy with you. And you can't rise above, in terms of your mood, I guess, or self-confidence, over where God thinks you should be. Now, there are some religions that are okay with joy. They're okay with celebrating. They're okay with having wine as part of their celebrations. They're okay with dancing and singing and with celebratory moments. And they're more comfortable with you expressing yourself through movement, even through sexuality and relating to your partners and feeling comfortable with your body. But unfortunately, within the Jehovah's Witnesses, those are not values. Those are not permissible. And one has to keep others in line, and you have to keep yourself in line. But for what? Because at the end of the day, you're not a better person. You're just a sadder person. You're just a person who feels less confidence, less joy. And I can't imagine that that's really what God wants, if you believe in God. What's also true is that if you have such a sense of being kind of made to look at everything in a black and white way, as it is in more fundamentalist branches of religions, then, as Jolie was talking about, it keeps you from picking up on nuance. Like if someone is not necessarily being truthful with you. Well, you're supposed to see them as good or bad. Well, sometimes they're truthful, sometimes not. If someone sometimes is trustworthy, sometimes not. If a situation is sometimes good, sometimes not. You don't learn how to discern. You don't learn how to tell. You just put these people in these two main categories, but that's not where life exists usually. And so there are plenty of people who I know, who were raised in fundamentalist branches of religions, who have a hard time reading the room. They have a hard time noticing what they need to notice to see if someone really feels a certain way about them or someone is someone you should trust or not. Because the way that you judge it is going to be based on other things like, are they believers? Are they following all the rules and the laws? If yes, they're good. If no, they're bad. That is entirely limiting. And really, what I think is more important to base your kind of critique on is, 
how that person treats other people, how that person mm, interacts with the world in a way that's honorable, in a way that's respectable and respectful, in a way that's safe or kind or good or generous. But none of that really matters when you're just dealing with a rule-based way of evaluating someone. So I've always taken umbrage with that. I've always thought that that was going to make sure that people could still be not great people and could be not kind. But if they follow the rules, they get kudos. They get elevated. They get seen as more spiritual, closer to God. That feels very off to me. Especially if when you talk to people from a whole variety of religions and you ask them, what is the most important tenant of their religion? Usually it is some version of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It should always be about that. Jolie is someone who is kind to others. And it comes through in her music, her thoughtfulness, her wanting to assess who she is, what the world is like, really think it through. And I wish more people took the time to do that. And not that she does it for kudos, but I wish more people got kudos for that, for taking a moment to think and to reflect and to see not only your part in the world, but how you, as an artist, want to share your emotions, want to share your thoughts, want to share your wisdom, not only for your benefit, but for the benefit of all those who are listening. Thank you, Jolie. And I look forward to having people hear your new album. And I look forward to having people hear your bonus episode. Take good care, everyone. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at Indoctrination Podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore indoctrination. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website at www.podpage.com forward slash indoctrination.